Um, my name is Kaya Dunn. I'm an associate professor now of um, anti-racist and equitable theater practice. Thank you. In the School of Drama, um, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm so very excited. Um, I think one of the first things after I got this job is I was like, I got to get Jason down here. Um, to introduce Jason VZ, who I know from A Strange Loop on Broadway, we work together, yeah. but also who did The Lion King, mm -hmm. which is a testament to his endurance, <laughs> um, and uh, is now doing Murders Only in the Building mm -hmm. with Steve Martin and mm -hmm. Martin Short so and Selena, Selena Gomez, Gomez, who somebody called another young actor on the radio the other day. And I was like, that is not who that is. Yeah. But, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, but also, one of the reasons I really wanted Jason to come, Jason is also a military brat who experienced moving. And I think, I think part of that... Um, aided his ability to advocate both for himself but for other people. Um, and so one of the main reasons I wanted him to come today is to talk not only about art and Broadway and all of the exciting creative things, but to talk about what it means to advocate, to be able to advocate for yourself, how that is important, and then what that means to, to know even when you're marginalized in a room, to know your privilege and how that allows you to advocate for others. Yes. Um, did yeah. I forget anything important you'd like me to mention? Jason is a fabulous dresser. I have always admired. <laughs> um, but I'll also like a good, a good human being, and I think a really great example of somebody who combines art and intellect and kindness uh, when, <laughs> when somebody <laughs> doesn't cross the line. Um, it, yeah, so... Welcome, Thank Jason. You. Thank, Thank you, you very for... much. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, it's um, we've been talking a lot today about. We, we, this is our fourth event today. I, yeah. I, I sort of went a little crazy, but but it's we've great. To, yeah, it's great. <laughs> Gives me time to finesse the talking points. Yeah, no, we've been talking a lot about advocacy, and and I have been thinking about the fact that. This wasn't something, I go back and forth sometimes about whether this was something that I learned how to do or if it was something that was laying dormant in me. Because truth be told, the practice of even standing up for myself didn't really happen until I was like 13 and in junior high. Um, <clears throat> I didn't have a strong history of being an assertive kid in the face of uh, conflict, unless it was in support or standing up for another classmate. But when it came to me, that just didn't really happen. I think um, a lot had to do with being um, <laughs> what my dad calls FMSTAs, future Miss Things of America. <laughs> 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 when he sees a young child usually male identified that exhibits some more fabulous behavior. Uh, he says it with love all the time. But I think, you know, I definitely experienced, you know, my share of being othered and bullied and violence definitely by no means um, as bad as a lot of my, uh, a lot of people I know in life. And it definitely did not happen to me at home. The home, with the house was not a battlefield for me, which is, a great thing. Um, and something happened um, when I was 13 that kind of shifted the course for me, which was the uh, first time that I ever kind of just said enough is enough and fought back with this kid who was just, you know, as the kids say, fucking around and he found out, you know, I had enough. And I think that that moment, we were talking about formative things, we were talking about artistic things, but for me, I think the most formative and definitive moment in my life was the first time that I remember at 13, in PE class, in junior high, after someone slapped me across the face with a pickleball paddle, looking around and making the decision to be like, hell no. And how that was the first step to me kind of stepping into power or whatever and setting me on a course to where that kind of bled into all other aspects of my life. And also, when the teachings of my parents who tried really hard to get their child who wasn't the best at standing up for themselves, trying to teach me all the things, when those things clicked. Yeah. 
you know. Um, uh, and I think when I think about advocacy and standing up for oneself and standing up for people, it's a, it's a practice. There are people who it comes to easier than others, you know. Like I stay, t say all the time, when I'm standing up for myself, whether it's <laughs> I'm unleashing or whatever, it does not change the fact that there's still a lump in my throat from when I was seven years old. It doesn't change the fact that like, it's not like I'm not scared, you know? So you, you mentioned earlier um, seeing yourself a lot before you got to college. Yeah. And I think yeah. in an educational setting, some of the things we wrestle with are like, how, how do you allow people to go through training, through artistic raising, as you call it, yeah. and, and maintain, especially if they haven't been in an environment where they find themselves in my majority situations. And I think, I think it's really helpful to hear mm -hmm. what that was because yeah. I think people in PWIs are trying to create that thing that happens. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about yes. your early teachers and what your mom did and like not being yeah. able to watch friends? It's, yeah. it's, 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 I truly, when I look back in terms of like one of the avenues of my life that I always felt truly confident and powerful in was theater and acting and all those things like that. But I think it's because I was in this perfect storm of, of, of things. One, I had a mother, both parents, but mostly my mother, who really didn't care what I did or what we did as long as we, the avenue was through the black thing first. So like, I had a mom who, who would get me a Barbie if I wanted to, but I was getting the black Barbie first. You know, that G.I. Joe, whose name was Barbecue, by the way. There was a black, yeah, 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 look it up. We got barbecue first, you know. She would, like, you know, for birthday cards, she would color in the little white boy as black. You know, Santa Claus is black, all those things, right? Um, so she made sure that when something came through, or if there was, like, a, anything that, that black people contributed to theater, she made sure that I saw first from movies and things like that. And then, you know, I happened to be living in Montgomery, Alabama, where a lot of my teachers... Were, looked like me as well, you know, and it was a community where like Alvin Ailey came through every year and, and we got to see all those types of things. Whilst also, I was born in 1980, and so the late 80s and early 90s were a, a Camelot era, of you will, starting with in film, the Spike Lee era. That's also when George C. Wolfe started coming into it in terms of theater. Then the new Jack Swing era of music, which is my, I could talk days about. Then, oh my God. <laughs> then, um, you know, on TV, from almost 1990 to 1995, on Sunday, you had Living Color, Rock, um, on Thursday, on, on you had the Cosby Show in a Different World on NBC, and then on Fox you had Martin Living Single, New York Undercover. There were just a lot of things that were happening. Then the rise of hip hop. So like I, w I cannot say that I grew up not um, without being exposed to people that look like me, and also seeing the world then ingest and then invest in our cultural contributions. But it's interesting because you say you don't know how like the advocacy thing started and as you're describing, because I'm, <laughs> yeah, no. I'm a mother, right? And yeah, I'm yeah. like, that, what you're describing is your mother fighting for her children to yeah, see themselves as I guess. like, that is such a, that, that's the advocacy. Yeah, right? like, I guess so. When you color those cards, because I've done that, yeah. right? Like, like, or you go find the thing. Yeah. And I, I mean, I feel like I know your parents because you right, talk about yeah. them so much, but every time you talk about your mother, it's, and then she did this. She didn't know yeah. Shakespeare, but she got me Othello. Right. right? Like, I guess I never thought about that. Like, I definitely, I definitely, definitely had parents who advocated for us and hoped for the best that, that stuck and, and I do know that in terms of my introduction to and exposure to the arts, I cannot remember a time where I did not think that having a career or being an artist was, was, wasn't possible. And I think when I hear people say, I didn't know it was possible because I didn't know there was a place for me, I never questioned that there wasn't a place for me. I saw it nonstop, you know? And recognize that. And I saw, even if, and I saw the world, capitalism, I saw them recognize it too. Because I saw the shift from when it went from hip hop to like 
everybody when it be, you know, I saw the shift from when pop culture really just became kind of black culture or in in my view and I think because I came up in that world by the time I got to a PWI um we should you, mention you you were one of you were the only black male all four years in it, your school in my yeah. In my program at University of Northern Colorado, I was the only black male all four years. And during my time there, there were a total of four or oh, five black women. But when I graduated, we lost one in the struggle. And when I graduated, there were just, uh, it was five of us total, myself and then four other women who, we, who are my sisters to this day. Um, and meaning it was just myself and my girl R3 in our class and the others were younger. So it wasn't a school that um, was known for uh, <laughs> or, or truly or a state that's known for that. And so when I moved to Colorado from Montgomery, Alabama and then went to high school and college there and was facing unintentional or intentional or soft or not soft at all. Um, barriers or or people trying to limit me or flat out telling me that you cannot do that because this is not what bad people do. It was quite easy for me to either boldly say that's a lie, that's not true, or literally just pay them no damn mind and keep my head moving. My counterparts, it was harder for them because they didn't have that exposure. And so, you know, truth be told, when it came to black literature and black theater, my professors couldn't teach me about that, but I knew it coming in. Chekhov, I think this is illuminating, yeah. especially because we have so many students here. When we think about what we do, defy or, or hold and up, and right. yeah, yeah, I was in uh, sophomore scene study classes, which is one of the most important classes in in your track of the of, of this this program. And I remember the professor using the reference Lepakin as a means to describe someone's movement because the character of Lepakin is a very specific physical type. And I asked him a question. I was like, what are you talking about? And the gasps that came from the professor and the rest of my classmates because I did not know Lepakin. Now, keep in mind, I have read enough Chekhov. It's just, it, this was just not the play I'd read yet, you know? And I remember this mini discussion about the fact that like, as a theater student, how could I not be aware of this character from this playwright if I'm going to be in school in theater? And I remember, it was one of the first times I remember, remember my parents, that was like, cause like, this is one of those moments where I can go ahead and be like, oh, hold on one second. And I said, stop, let's serve it, let's take a serve it, let's play a game. Tell me about Joe Turner's come and gone. Tell me about Flying West by Pearl Cleage. Please tell me about For Color Girls, please. So you're telling me that we're gasping and questioning my ability to be a, an A plus student in the game and an artist because I haven't read one of the plays written by a man who only writes about rich Russian people who never change or never learn anything, in my opinion. So we're gonna sit here and expect me to know Hamlet, Blanche Dubois, and Josie and Moon for the Misbegotten, but you can't tell me about Harold Loomis or Walter Lee Younger? That's weird to me. That's weird to me. Like, because to me, those are classics. And at this point in time, this is 1998, 1999, 2000, August Wilson's legacy was already solidified as one of the most prolific and honored playwrights of American history, period. Yet none of these kids who are my contemporaries could even tell you one thing about it. But I have to know about Ibsen. Make it make sense. And so that's when I realized at the very least, I might not be able to stand up for myself in all aspects of my life, but when it comes to theater and how I feel about theater and my contribution, you're not gonna play games in my face about things like that, it's just not happening. Especially when I'm sitting here knowing more about theater just because I have to know black theater and white theater. I, I, had, I had a coworker last year berate me because I didn't know the words to a Simon and Garfunkel song, Song of Silence. And he was just like, you don't know 
one, the lyrics to one of the most popular duets, do du, du, one of popular songs from one of the most popular duos in American history, and I go, oh, we grew up listening to the Isley Brothers. That's the duet I, I listened to. I didn't listen to Simon and Garfunkel. You know, I don't know about Peter, Paul, and Mary. I know about SWB, you know? And who were you to tell me that that didn't change my world or influence me in a way that, you know, and I think because I had the education that I had about the contributions of my community to theater, it was quite easy for me to better deal with the roadblocks that are presented in the face of blatant racism, ignorance, prejudice, lack of information, lack of literature, lack of study. Thank God I had known all this literature up until that point that was written um, because if I didn't, I definitely know I would be floundering and missing something and feeling so outside of myself in this art form because these people were incapable of, of that. Can I ask, so on that road, if yeah. we fast forward a, a lot, yeah. a little lot, yeah. we'll come back to Lion King. But um, when, I haven't asked you this yet today, okay. when was the first time you think you started advocating on Strange Loop and what was that? journey from and like if you can just give a little bit of background the 10 years and all of yes so strange loop uh is a show that i was a part of that is very near and dear to my heart uh we had some success uh you know it won, it won the tony all these things like that you know it ended up being a great it was a great platform for me and i'm still experiencing the positive benefits of being a part of that show and I'll get to specifically why I believe that to be true. Um, but my own journey with, um, we all had a very long journey with it. My own journey with it is a total of 10 years. My, fir my first year, my first reading of it was 10 years to the day of us opening on Broadway. So there's, it was very lived in experience and a lot, and we've been working with the same group of people for a very long time, which does not happen. Usually at some point in time, we get you know replaced by someone famous or, you know, and uh, so that was a cool thing for us to be together and create this thing that we used to rehearse in a porn studio, a literal gay porn studio. And when I think about the first time that I remember advocating, the smallest, the small, in the smallest instance, the first time I remember advocating was when we, Finally got a, Raja, the choreographer. I love Raja. It was the first time that we started physicalizing what it meant for, to be a thought, which is the ensemble. And we were frustrated because it was very clear at that point that we were dealing with someone who was extremely creative and really rooted for us and pushed us in a great way, but didn't really understand that like what you want from us, we can do as long as we're not singing this score. <laughs> if we're lip syncing, we got you. But if you want us singing these notes, and so I had to be like, look, uh, we can make all this work, but there's gonna have to be an adjustment on either the vocabulary of, of, the, of the choreography, or we gonna have to change some of these notes and that's not happening. So like, we're not doing that triple pirouette. That's like a soft version, right? <laughs> I think the next biggest time of advocacy happened at Playwrights, and unfortunately, it was me advocating for myself in the face of some very unprofessional behavior during a performance at the hands of um, a then co-star. Um, and that was a big one, because we had kind of already been dealing with um, a shift in the space and 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 it not being a safe space for all because of one person. Um, and I am, truth be told, I am someone who nothing drives me bonkers more than an entire space or group of people catering to one person, especially if it's crazy behavior, that just kind of drives me nuts. I don't know if it's because I'm the first child or have a bunch of siblings, but like I, we, we just can't do it. You know, um, if we all want to go to Applebee's and you don't want to go to Applebee's, then find your ass at McDonald's because we're going to Applebee's. <laughs> we're hungry, you know? Um, so that, unfortunately, was the first time that I think 
not unfortunately, unfortunately maybe for some people, was the first time that I think people saw that part of my boundary setting, that part of my personality, um, that part of how I deal with that part of the process, if that process goes. And now that I think about it, that might add to why I felt afterwards I kind of stayed protected because I, because in actuality I protected myself and that set up how I was going to be treated moving forward when things got, quite frankly, even worse than what we ever could expect given what happened moving to Broadway. Um, and I think about that moment all the time in terms of how it could have still negatively impacted things moving forward and maybe that's a little bit of me taking things on that I don't need to take on, but I think about that all the time. Did I handle it well? What was the proper protocol? But then I also think about the fact that, like, if I wouldn't have said anything, people would have let it happen and not protected me at, at all yeah. in the space. So I think about that a lot. And then, I, and, I, and, I, and then moving forward, it just became this beautiful dichotomy of, like, wow, this thing that we made is happening. But there's a strong deterioration going on in the dynamic of the family when it became a family business. Um, Explain what you mean by that. Yeah, I mean that none of us could have foreseen because this was every, the majority, it was the majority of people's Broadway debut, myself and um, another castmate of mine, Antoine Hopper, who's an alumni of here. We had both been on Broadway before, but it was our first time doing something like this, where it's building something and originating a role so many Broadway debuts, and so I don't think that, yes, we did Off-Broadway, and yes, we did Willie Mammoth, but it still maintained that small family feel. And then when you put that show into the big Broadway capitalistic commercial business model, when I look back, so many of the mistakes that we made, there was no way that we could have foreseen a lot of them. I truly believe that it was a you know and to you know. Now, there are some things that like, you know, but it, it, was, it was, it paralyzed us. I don't think we knew how to deal with the fact that we were no longer a cherished piece of art and a cherished group of artists, but then we became numbers, products. Literally products. Product, like I have yes. products with you products. on the, yeah. Yeah, products. Um, even I think about the fact that I love the fact that, and, I, and I'm gonna say this, because uh, it needs to be said, I love the fact that because of a specific journey of a cast member in our show and making sure that the language around the show um, was inclusive and indicative of who's telling the story, beforehand it was the big black and, and gay ass American Broadway show. Mm. Things shift and change and transition. And then for to those of you who don't know, it then became the big Black, black and queer, queer ass, ass American, American Broadway, Broadway show, show because it wasn't just gay men on stage telling the story. Mm -hmm. And I love the fact that we did that, but then the, it kind of shifted. And then the marketing of that show, when I think about it, really landed on the shoulders of the lone non cis person in our cast mm -hmm. without the support. the support and without the recognition. You know, to this day, you know, it's funny because I would watch people go up to them and feel so seen by her and be like, it's, I'm, I'm so happy to see a, 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 a queer trans story on stage. And she would say, you're not watching a queer trans story. You're watching a story about a gay boy and someone queer and someone trans and queer is helping to tell the story. So, so, so yes, you should feel affirmed in the fact that you can now see it's possible that we can be on Broadway, but do not mistake. This identity is being used as a marketing tool. But I also love, I got to introduce El Morgan and Tanya Pinkins yeah. on opening night barefoot yeah. at 3 a.m. in Manhattan. <laughs> um, and I remember El, because that was a hard show for any black femme yes. that was in the yes. room. Mm -hmm. um, but I was walking but also, yes. also a blessing and yes. hard. And I remember Elle talking about as she became more confident and comfortable yeah. in her identity, how her advocacy and her awareness of needing to advocate mm -hmm. grew, but also not wanting to be a problem. And so that struggle and, that and everybody how, faces and then being sort of made this like right. 
standard bearer right. while still sort of str and and it was just a really beautiful generous thing for her to say yeah. of like i'm seeing people now because right. of my journey and yeah you know one of the one of the um i'm probably gonna cry about this one of the things that i'm so that i look back about the whole journey is fortunately for those of us who don't identify as trans and non-binary fortunately we how we're blessed to learn so much via mistakes and self-advocacy on what it means to have blind spots even when you're feeling affirmed. Fortunately, I was able to learn that as a cis gay black man, but unfortunately it came at the cost of the souls of some of the people in the cast, who I love very much. I'm so sorry, y'all, uh, because there are still scars and harm that are there, that happened for this very beautiful thing. Um, uh, and I'll be forever grateful. But um, the sad part is, when we're talking about efficacy, they were taking care of the peace and making sure that everyone was safe, and no one really was taking care of them. No one really was taking care of them. And I think that, you know, unfortunately, uh, it's a double-edged sword to look back at that experience that is one of the best experiences and I'll be hard pressed to find an experience that I'll ever have like that again in that specific way that also has elements of that for some people but also is extremely harmful because the advocacy wasn't set up and even when it was tried to be set up, it was not listened to, you know? And, um, and that's kind of the nature of a lot of things in the business when you go into this model and in this day and age of maybe performative advocacy and things like that, I constantly think about how much I benefited from their bravery and resilience. Enough to where I can say moving forward, um, I know how to be a better advocate and ally and things like that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, I feel like I had to release some feelings of like, I guess the best word is like maybe survival guilt because we've talked about this, everything was meant for me to be the most protected in this space in the way that I met. Can you expand on that for people who yeah. haven't been part of our three year yeah, conversation? So, true, yeah. <laughs> so essentially if you don't know what Strange Loop is about, Strange Loop centers on a fat gay black boy um, who does not feel or, or is seen as attractive in his own, in, in either communities, writing about a fat gay black boy. It's very meta, you know, and trying to find his voice and write this show. And he's surrounded by six of his thoughts and we play everything from ancestors to sexual partners to his daily self-loathing. Subway riders. Subway riders, things like that. And um, the cast for the most part was also comprised of a lot of people who also are people that you normally don't get to see on Broadway for various reasons, whether they be femme, black boys, or dark-skinned, or of size, and things like that. And um, it's very, it can be a very affirming show to be a part of. Um, and I was the, one of the light, in the main cast, the lightest skinned person in the main cast. Um, uh, I am not a person of size. Um, I have always kind of aligned with society's ideas of what is conventionally attractive, or at least I've never gone through life in this business feeling like I can't be the leading man. You know what I'm saying? Um, and for some reason, I realized early on that because of those things, they were gonna listen to me if I said something more. And that's okay, and I knew that, so it's just time for me to advocate. And, and because of that, that platform, that visual platform, begat lots of TV work for me and it was a great springboard for me in my career and in the way that it has not happened with some of my other amazingly talented superhuman colleagues. And so it being the best possible experience that one could have, it took me a long time to be okay with that. Um, because I think the world of that group of people and they deserve everything and so it took me a long time to be okay with that. And I think that I always kind of knew that it might 
is going to be easier for me, which has also aided in me wanting to advocate and yell at the top of my lungs if I needed to in those spaces because if I do, the repercussions are not going to be the same, the same yeah. unfortunately, you know. I also got a mouth on me, but, the, but, but, but you know, but, uh, and I, but I also think that that's kind of part of it. And I think that especially when you are in a group of people who are part of marginalized, underrepresented, and under-researched, I'm going to steal that from L. Morgan Lee in terms of the way that she's trying to use a, use a new phrase, under-researched groups, I also find that it's very easy when you're part of that community to kind of focus on your otherness mm -hmm. and forget about that you might still have some privileges within that otherness. Um, and that fortunately for me has never really been that hard to do. I don't know if that's natural in me. I don't know if that's my mom always. It's, your mom. it's my yeah, I was gonna say it's probably it's most it's mostly my mom, yeah. The perspective and things like that. And I think that like that I, I I'm finding that advocacy for those of us in marginalized groups, when the, we're in like-minded, when we're in like company or likely like othered company, like othered company, um, that's where we have the hardest time. Yeah. That's where we have the hardest time, for sure. And uh for some reason, it's just, it's hard to latch on to because you're so blinded by your own <laughs> oppression, yeah. I guess, you know? And doing that. Yeah. I want to take a few minutes because we, yeah. we are coming, but I want to know if anybody has any questions or questions. things that they've been thinking about. Or Please help me stop babbling. Not babbling. <laughs> but um, yeah, or anything you've been wondering about or anything that struck you. Mm. Yeah, Nairi. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Something that you said when you spoke to my class and yeah. that really stuck out to me because I feel like it goes directly against what we're told as uh -huh. actors yeah. is, you know, don't, you can't give 100%. It's not sustainable. It's not something that you can maintain, but yeah. just give whatever percent that you're at. Mm -hmm. Give like the best, whatever percent that is. Yeah. And I don't like... I just think that that was like difficult for me to hear because like <laughs> also I want to talk about like like just like being black like yeah. my mom like <laughs> has always like made me very aware that I'm going to have to work a lot harder yes. than other people 10 times harder Exactly Yes, yes. Which is exact which which is exactly why I stress that number 1 start the practice of that now, but it's really gonna be hard because the thing is, I want you in your training to give 100% in an effort to, fig to figure out what happens to you when you go, when you give 100%. When I say, I'm not talking about like not working hard, but like for example, at some point in time in your training, you learn how to manage living in a space or a story or a person that is really going through some fucked up shit. And living in those spaces is not natural unless it's actually your trauma, right? The reality is, is that we're, we're being trained to utilize the things that have happened to us in order to fully inhabit other characters. And if you're playing some, somebody that has to be going through something, part of your training is learning how to get there and connect to that stuff that's within you. Mm -hmm. But there's not a lot of training in terms of at what cost. I don't care what you see. I must say, I don't care what you see on these TVs and films, in these movies. It is amazing what actors can do on TV, film, and stage. But on TV and film, you get to do it and it's done. You don't have to do it every night, two times a day. You don't. Do you know For Color Girls? Yes. Do you know the, 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 Bo, the Bo Willie monologue? No. Well, then you don't know For Color Girls. Yeah! It's, the, it's, it's the monologue Lady in Red where this woman's lover throws her babies out the window. It is the monologue of the show, right? Do what, Film that? Sure. Eight times a week. Pregnant. Yeah pregnant eight times a week. It is fantastic that you can go there, but you will find after living that journey 
eight times a week, sometimes twice a day, that's going to take its toll on anyone. And you've got to find a way of managing it. Because again, they're not paying you enough mm -hmm. to have a breakdown or have a heart attack, particularly when you are a, a, a black, she, her? Yes. When you're, a, when you're a black woman and we already have been told that we have to work, you're already working 10 times as hard. So in terms of your craft for yourself and your own personal knowledge of your instrument, go there and give 100% on getting the journey. But when you get into this professional world where the schedule is eight times a week, you will not survive. Here, here, and here. And the reality is, what happens is, is that we don't know that because no one talks about it. If someone wins an Oscar, we don't know what they went through. Like someone told Ellen Morgan Lee, who ended up being the first openly trans actress to be nominated for a Tony, when you break the glass ceiling, you will get cut. Right? So yes, someone's lauded for their performance, but like they're not being lauded for what they went through. Yeah. And so the starting the practice of advocating for yourself to further preserve your instrument. And your instrument is your heart and your head. It's your soul. That's your canvas. So I'm always going to be for advocating, fighting the good fight. Listen, until further notice, capitalism is not going to change. They're going to do eight shows a week, right? And if I, after not missing a show and am tired... Either I call out or I say, you know what, if I want to finish strong, right, this week and get through it, that means one of these shows on Saturday is going to be a really good 75 to 80% show. It might even be a 65% show because I might, I might just be dragging my ass. But that's okay. This give it a hundred, when, you know, they say give it a hundred percent, give it all you got. Well, I don't got 100%. I'm going to give it all I got, but that got might be 25%. Talk to your parents and see if they were giving 100% every day raising your ass. Yeah, no. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I do want to lift up, the, like, Dr. Barbara Ann Tieran's here. Yes. She talks uh. about not using Stanislavski. Yes. Because when you are forced to play a slave or a servant, right. taking that on mentally is harmful to black bodies. So right. Because... So often people are like, oh, this new idea. And it's like, that was written in 1967, yeah. 1978. Like, people have been talking about this, but it, it has been purposely sort of swept under the rug. Mm -hmm. It's not professional. That's that black theater over there. Right. Right. right that is now. Right. Um, right. A lot of these ideas. About, right. Like, there have been people saying, don't. Do, they say it a little differently. Yes. Like, like, don't take this into your soul. Into your soul. Right. And to this end, and Without having some ramifications. And this might not be the best way to train black students and other students right. from traumatized backgrounds. From traumatized backgrounds. And also, too, it's like one of those things where, like, in drama school, you listen, and, like, did it make me resilient? Yes, but, like, you know, this thing, I don't know if it happens here, but, like, I'm from the generation where, like, it could be just singing a song from a musical, and there's every, once there's a class where you get up there, and then the, the, the teacher asks you what in your life has happened. And then you tell this crazy story about abuse to strangers or your class, and there's an honor system that no one's going to talk about it to anybody else, just so you can sing 10 minutes ago from Cinderella, from Cinder, Roger Hamilton and Cinderella. Why do I have to tell you about something that I suffered as opposed to being like, is there something that you connect with? Great, find it. We don't have to talk about it, right? But that's been part of the, the training, and when we when we're trained to think I've got to give my blood, sweat, and tears, yes. Or my history. Or my history, you know? Um, and that's just not the case in the model of performance and business model that's going on. And also, too, at the end of the day, if I don't tell you that I'm giving 65%, you don't know. It's also none of your business. If I'm slacking and missing my marks and and – you know, that's different. But, like, it's actually none of your business if I'm giving 100% or not. It's not. Because you don't know unless I tell you. And if I'm giving 100% as, a, as, a, as an actor, 
and an artist on this stage telling the story every night, and you're giving me 50% as a producer or a director or a creative, then we are at a crossroads because I'm working harder than you are. So if, you know, like one of my favorite quotes from Clueless, if you didn't do your homework assignment, I can't do mine, right? It's just the way we got to act and move forward now. And it's, a, and it's, a, it's also a very soft and undercover way of resistance. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Um, how do you know when to give a little and when to take a little? Your body tells you. Your spirit tells you. It happens to us every day. Your body tells you when you need to sit down to take a nap. Whether you take a nap is different, but like your body tells you when you are run down. Your body tells you, how are we gonna do this today? Your body tells you something is not right. Your body is always telling you. We have just been trained to put those things to the side in the spirit of hustle culture, working hard. And there are benefits, of course we wanna work hard, you know, but your body will tell you, without a doubt. And the thing is, you know, if you don't end up listening to your body, then you end up having a heart attack, having a mental breakdown, you know, passing out. Vocal nerve surgery. Vo vo vocal, vocal surgery, right? Over a play, you know, where you're not making Marvel Cinematic Universe money. And even then, still, that's, you know what I'm saying? So you'll know. And the thing is, people around you that also love you and know your heart and spirit, they'll also see it as well. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's a good gig. It's a good gig. It's uh it's um you know, TV is such an interesting thing and you know, it's so funny when you see like uh people who are primarily TV and film, they they go to do theater for the first time and they always talk about the hardest thing. And like I'm kind of like, yeah, it is, but like TV film can be grueling, for sure. It's a different kind of grueling, but like, I don't think people really understand when it comes to theater, like, just the repetition of telling a specific story, even if it's like a happy story or something that doesn't, you know, cost you anything emotionally, just the physical labor of getting the energy to do live performance consistently. You know, it's like, any baseball pitcher is going to have an injury at some point in time because their shoulder is doing the same thing over and over and over again. The same kind of injuries can happen physically with doing a show, emotionally for sure doing a show, depending on what you're having to portray. So can you quickly talk about advocacy in that space, in the film and television space versus the theaters? Because theater is like your directors, producers, right. the writer in the room. So yeah. I will say this. I fully understand how people feel scared and terrified in the TV and film industry to advocate for themselves. I truly believe the only reason why I'm able to advocate for myself now in TV and film is because I'm just not 22 anymore. Like, I'm at the age now where I'm kind of like, yo, what's set in place is set in place. We're not, we're not doing that. I'm just getting to my ornery uncle phase. You know, I cannot say that if I were 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, that I wouldn't fall prey to holding my tongue in an effort to move forward in my career. Because also with TV and film, you're dealing with so much money and people who are like, fuck you rich. They don't have to care. It's, it's, it's even more clear in TV and film that you can be replaced like that. So I understand, especially if you're younger, why you keep your mouth shut or in the face of abuse, um, you know, sexual assault, all those things. And because of that, I had no choice because I wasn't going to go backwards in my advocacy. So when I experienced in what I consider a very egregious form of communication um, on a show, I just, I just came out swinging, you know? I came out swinging. I, w I, was, I was too grown to compromise myself in that way for something that's not guaranteed, you know? 
um, it would have been disrespectful in that moment that we've talked about, not only to myself, but truly to my parents and my ancestors, to just be spoken to like that because I have a glimmer of an opportunity or a check, you know? And I think this business, and that's, that's not to say that I might fall off that path. And I don't know what's going to happen. But I do know this, this business in general, but particularly with people of color, particularly with black folks, particularly with women, is really good at confusing us or at convincing us of things so we confuse, so we confuse bones with blessings. And I know the difference between a bone and a blessing. I know the d big difference between a bone and a blessing. And so I think, I do think it's harder to advocate for yourself in TV and film because there's just more on the line and it's even more apparent that you are just a number. Theater feels softer because you're constantly around community and you're building something full time and you can, you can kind of see where everyone's at. You know what I'm saying? You know where everyone's at. You, you, the grimy people, you can see them over there. You can see the lines of real people. Whereas, you know, in, in TV and film, it, it's it's someone, that man behind the curtain, you know, the power that comes with TV and film is can be, I think, quite terrifying if you don't go in having seen a lot of cautionary tales. So by the time I got to a place where I was doing that and working on it, it was either I let them know now immediately in the most assertive way that I know how, or I'm never going to do it for myself because it's, it's too enticing to not. Yeah, you know? And also I'm Jamaican, so we tend to, <laughs> we, tend to <laughs> we tend to have a verbal blade with us at all times, if not an actual blade. I bet. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate you too. Um, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Of course, of course.